so on Jonathan's reflection about notation as technology, um, I'd like to uh, respond with uh, Vicari and Barnett's notion of technics, because I think notation can also be considered as an artifact that carries history and culture beyond our deaths, um, amongst many other human practices. I'd like to just start also as a kind of a caveat by saying where I'm coming from. Um, this was one of Jonathan's slides, actually, that he flipped over. But it's an image of Xenakis with his Yupik taken in 78. I think it was taken in Lille. But um, in July 78, I went to the Centre à Comte, which was the Xenakis summer school at the Conservatoire d'Arius Mio. And we had masterclasses every day with him, um, looking at statistics and probabilities, looking at laws of distribution and constraints, and using these conceptual frameworks to analyze Xenakis's works. And it was an absolutely fantastic experience and a, an astonishing leap between um, the handling of quite abstract mathematical and conceptual entities um, and axioms and the immense physicality of the sonic architectures that Xenakis was able to produce with this. And he reveled in it, and so did we. And there were lots of performances throughout the summer school. So it was, was quite an extraordinary experience that's marked me. And also, we, were, we worked on the UPIC with Guy Medig each day. And again, this, this kind of graphic projection possibility um, allowed Xenakis to push the envelopes of, of, of ways of thinking about structuring these, these new kinds of, of masses and clusters. But then I hitched over to La Sainte Baume, where John Cage had a summer school, which was run by um, Jean-Luc Choplin. And that was an equally astonishing and obviously a radically different experience. Uh, Cage led a creation of Variations 4, and his, um, this is not the, from La Sainte Baume, uh, nobody took photos in those days, otherwise we would have all been selfied to death, of course, but in 78 that didn't exist. But what was amazing was how rigorously Cage implemented um, chance-determined art making. And so in both instances, there were people who were dealing with stochastic processes, um, one obviously very mathematically sophisticated and the other quite, quite simple in some ways, um, and, and producing extremely different types of creation. And, and my, my work has constantly been torn between, um, I would say quite happily and unhappily, between these extremes. So in Cajun terms, we demarcate art from non-art by selectively reframing existing materials um, or inventing and synthesizing new ones. And then notation imposes a further layer of separation on this initial separation that underpins artistic processes. Um, we, we have these marks that represent core parameters of given operations, um, as in what Trevor Wishart has wonderfully called uh, classical music's finite lattice of pitched sound objects. So this lattice organizes sounds of relatively short duration and fixed timbre, but of course the nature of notation systems, as, as Jonathan's been pointing out so eloquently, is bound up with what we want to do with them and what we want them to do. Um, is notation a prescriptive coding to enable the gift, the recreations of work, or is it descriptive? In which case, why don't we simply use recordings? Can an analogous or isomorphic trace of an action constitute notation? And how much must we mediate material for it to qualify as notation? So, of course, the traditional score, as we know, is a, is a somewhat abstract tool. It marks its distance from the embodied musician, addressing movements indirectly through its encoded instructions. But technologies that record and notate human actions directly sampling live motion as mechanical effort offer ways to notate that somehow feel much closer to the bone. Um, and this is an area um, that Brian Rotman, <laughs> whom again Jonathan's mentioned, uh, calls gesturo haptics. It's, it's, sorry, and John Rose is nudging his way in on there. He shouldn't be. Um, this has got a long history. It goes back to the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, Angelo Mosso's ergograph, which translates a finger or literally digital uh, movements through a quill and pen mechanism and different weights and bands. This is connected to a chymograph, which is a kind of a, a rotating uh, cylinder with a manometer. And the chymograph allows you to record on, on um, flame-blackened surfaces um, the traces of exertion. So you get these readings, these fatigue curves. Um, 
and they're, they're fixed with shellac so that you can preserve them and compare them. So, so these are motion sampling systems, direct motion sampling systems. And even the more sophisticated uh, motion captured violinist on the right, this was done in 2007 in uh, Culture Lab in Newcastle. Um, these, these kinds of uh, representations or notations ensure what Rotman calls asymbolic mediation. They provide technically autonomous data, yet there's something that's extremely compellingly immediate about the way that they relate to and convey physical action. So I'm, I'm trying to look at the relations between notational systems and gestures, and also at our culturally immensely variable construals of immediacy and mediation, which are subject to very different literacies. Correlations between symbols or the actual traces of action and a reference field aren't just one-to-one -one matches between <coughs> markings and actions, but they are overall inscriptive systems that establish specific sets of relationships amongst their constituents. So even if we see notation and the production of sonic events as simultaneous and tangled operations, or even if we see notation as just being the trace of an essentially unrepeatable event, we still have to define a framework in order to set up the relational dynamics that can make up the artwork. And Cage does this as much as anybody. Sonic writing requires structure, and we need to establish meaningful correlations between our notated marks and our sounds. So this, this means we've got inclusion and exclusion choices that define scale, context, scope of reference field, and so on. Herman Gutschewski calls these subjective choices or bias the notation perspective, the bias in favor of elements that are easily notated against those that are harder or impossible to notate. But then again, we qualify things as easy or hard as a function of our literacies, our cultures, and our previous skills. So we're kind of going around in circles. I'm interested in how our exacerbated prosthetization in 2016 requires us to deal with concepts that thoroughly outstrip our cognitive capacities and what we think of as being our embodied knowledge or experience. How can we scale the rush of unfathomable data that we've unleashed so that we can relate to it meaningfully as humans? Within the biosphere, the Anthropocene, <coughs> and the cosmos, we're operating at all these levels. And I just want to give two very extreme examples of sonic art that I think push the envelope about uh, notational thinking. Um, so this is John, you're allowed up now. Um, John Rose and Hollis Taylor, they're Great Fences of Australia project. And John says that performing on fences places the musician in an area where terrain, map, score, and instrument are physically connected and signified, if not interchangeable. This work is eminently embodied. It's hot, dusty, and sweaty. You need veils to protect you from the insects. And it operates at a scale that exceeds all our usual understandings of sonic arts practices, even in our radical 21st century. Rose bows the rabbit-proof, dingo-proof, dog-proof fences uh, that crisscross the Australian outback. And he says that fences are the perfect metaphor for all kinds of man-made endeavors, disasters, contradictions, and hubris. And amongst those contradictions and hubris, um, he positions the fencing off of Cartesian dualism, um, which has led us to, I quote, a situation maybe too late, where we're trying to reconnect with an animate planet full of beings, fauna or flora, that we've treated as not us. We've fenced off and trashed to the edge of extinction. Western man defines his world with fences like all good mammals that mark out their territory. And I'm wondering whether the grid configurations of Australian fences, and there are several million kilometers of them, um, makes them perhaps the ultimate impositions of lattice logic uh, in the wild, this thing that rose so fiercely and artistically subverts with his instrumental virtuosity. And then the last example for my one minute is this art sat dispatch to Deep Space Amateur Troubadours Challenge. This is a satellite that was launched by Tama Art University in December 2014 on a JAXA commercial satellite. Um, it was located 4.7 million kilometers from the Earth when it stopped transmitting. It had only a single battery that lasted 27 days. This was the longest communication distance registered ever between amateur radio stations. It carried a rich array of sensors, and its onboard computer ran an algorithm that mobilized readings from the sensors to compose, e encode, and transmit acoustic poetry structured according to a rhythm phrase based on Dadaist Hugo Ball's poem, Gadji Beri Bimba. 
This rhythm phrase converted to current or angular velocity was detected by the ground stations who shared fragments of the broadcast material through the web, web to de- and reconstruct the poem to estimate the spacecraft's position and trajectory. So basically, I'd suggest this is a piece of collaboratively interpreted sound art where polyrhythmic cues, the signals, are <coughs> correlated with a predefined reference field to provide real-time notation of a spacecraft's <coughs> coordinates. And I'll leave it with those two examples. Thank you. How distinguished the Techniques and technology, just, just understand terms here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Well, I, I look at Romford's techniques and civilization um, as, as being a wonderfully open way of describing this intimate, uh, inseparable human relationship with our artifactual environment. Um, and, and I guess in some ways that could be made synonymous with technology, don't think. Um, that's another question I'm torn by. But uh, what also, perhaps coming from, from Mumford, but also coming from um, Le Roi Bourron and Simon Don and some of the French thinkers, who's writing on techniques and Horsega, um, and it's Thank you. And the um, Vakari and Barnett quote comes from a text they've written on Stigler and Technics. Um, there's, a, there's a broader notion of technique that perhaps in the French <coughs> culture uh, complies with this uh, totally entangled mess of humans fabricating their cognitive and their external scaffolding. So I like techniques for that reason. I have a question. Um, thank you very much. That's really interesting. I'm also very interested in the mappings between just rotation and you saw these uh, uh, thick curves, or uh, for example, the mock-up from a violin performance. But those are things that cannot actually be read. So where would you place the difference? to a more traditional notion of notation, both as mnemotechnics, but also as some sort of playback mechanism. One cannot read a mock-up snapshot or even, you know, a mock-up video recording. Well, I, I would actually dispute that, um, because what I've shown you is a, is a frame grab from a, a, a mock-up sequence. And actually, for a bioengineer, for somebody working in biomechanics, the, the violin mocap, where we used the time possibilities to develop the trails, is absolutely obscene. It's illegible, because a bioengineer will only read uh, graphs and stats, and he will read movement and very precise joint movement off reams of figures that, for me, are illegible graphs and stats. So this is why I'm insisting on, on literacies. A dancer... Uh, will associate quite readily with, with some of the readings that probably look very obscure to a musician who's come through a stave-type um, literacy. So I, 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 think, um, I think it's a question of crossing over literacies. And this is why, for example, the, the event, there's an event that uh, Frédéric is quite involved with, which is called uh, MOCO, uh, Movement and Computing, which brings together... Uh, musicians and, and dancers and, and sports people and people with different kinds of gestural and corporeal literacies to see how they might learn from each other's readings. So I'm, I'm being a bit naughty because I'm not really answering your question very kindly, but I do think that those, I think we can read anything. The problem is to work out where those readings can be made useful for others and whether we can learn from what other, people's re other people read.